Good day and welcome to the Roar Rundown Sports Podcast. I am your host, Chris Gay, joined by my co-host, Zach Cloud and Weston Bailey. So we have quite a bit to talk about. So I'm I'm not even going to waste any time. Let's jump right into it. So Henderson State came to Bill Vining Arena. What a what a day on Thursday, the for basketball. If you didn't catch my drift, but women's basketball played Henderson State Thursday, and that wasn't even the craziest thing that happened on this Thursday. And this game ended in a double overtime on a buzzer beater that just rimmed out. It was so close. Feel bad for Grayson Williams because that that hurts more than an air ball, frankly. But. Washita lost 92 to 94, which is the most points they've actually scored at home all season long. Actually, all season long with the 92, previous was 91, and that game was tight. 14 ties in the game. The lead changed 13 times, and I know both of you guys were there. First of all, that crowd was electric. That's the best crowd, and obviously it's Battle of the Ravines. Of course, it's going to draw the best crowd, but that's the best crowd that. Bill Vining Arena is seen all year long, and I think the players could feel it. Yeah, uh, both sides brought a lot of energy, and I think one thing that surprised me was uh, how many, not just like fans for Henderson, but students for Henderson. There was a lot of students for Henderson that showed out, and so that was um, that was really cool to see. But yeah, especially like, because like you said, it went to double overtime, so especially towards the end of regulation, it was rocking. The end of the regular overtime period, it was really loud, and then obviously at the very end of double overtime was probably the loudest loudest it was all night. But yeah, it was, it was loud enough to hurt your ears. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, and Chris, I'll let you go over like these stats, but yeah. I, I was there, the whole baseball team was there. We don't get out very often, but we had to be there for, <laughs> the, for this game. Um, it was this women's basketball game. I said it to you guys right before the show started. It was the best basketball game I've ever seen in my life, and yeah. I'm not like a basketball nobody. I do frequently watch, and this this game, whether you're watching on live stream or in person, just had an incredible electric feel to it, and it was just astonishing to watch, honestly, and it was so awesome to see these girls that we talk about you know on a weekly basis now really go at it and see what they're actually capable of in person yeah it, it felt like we were watching like a classic in madison square garden almost yeah, it, it was it was pretty awesome and um and it wasn't even the best performance for washita but there are a few things first of all i think of course it was double overtime i think it was almost eight o'clock or after eight when the men's game started the men's game was supposed to start at seven thirty. And I think was everybody was kind of tired at that point because yeah. it wasn't until like after ten that the day was over. And that game drained me. Just yeah, being there. well, the men's game was tight too, but the crowd wasn't as into it as they were in the women's game. Just because everybody, I think, was just had let out all their energy already. But anyway, uh, one thing before I get into the stats, this game. The the women played outstanding, considering all the foul trouble that there was. Um, One thing that I noticed during the game, I was on color, and uh, Samantha Watson and Joey Babel both fouled out of the game, and so did Henderson's all-time leading scorer and best player, Ashley Farrar. Uh, But the problem was, initially they told her that she had fouled out like in the third quarter. She got mad went to the bench and then later they told her oh no you only have four fouls and so she goes back in then she fouls out then gets a technical but she truly fouled out at that point uh and actually i think she might have gotten ejected i don't quite remember but anyway same thing happened to grace and fairless except minus the technical she was told she fouled out when according to the online stat tracker it showed that she had four fouls so i don't know what's wrong i don't know if it was an error online but even today looking just a few minutes ago still showed she had four fouls she fouled out and i don't think she played in either double or uh, overtime periods maybe the first at the very beginning i don't remember but um she was missed. She was sorely missed in this game, and uh, she had 12 points and eight rebounds, and I think Washita probably would have found a way to win if she had played. Um, but some great performances from OBU. This is the best shooting performance that Washita has had, I think, since conference season has tipped off. They shot just under 50% from the field, 57% from the three-point line, considering that 
Coach Dallimore had said that they're in a shooting crisis. Uh, pretty good. 81% from the free throw line. Uh, of course, they didn't shoot a lot of three-pointers. They did most of their work in the paint, 50 points in the paint, 16 points off turnovers, and also out-rebounded Henderson State, who has a lot of uh, a lot of size. Now, a big negative is they had 25 turnovers, and you know that's just not going to cut it. And Henderson still shot pretty well from the field, but also dominated inside and had 26 points off of turnovers, and that's definitely not going to make Coach Dallimore happy. But going into the individual performers, Madeline Tipton had 18 points. She had to step it up big. Still no Heidi Robinson, still out with an injury. Laney Mears just hasn't been as effective because defenses have been holding her down hard. So it had to be Madeline Tipton. She put the team on the back, and it worked out pretty well. Had 18 points. She played even better against Harding on Saturday. We'll talk about that in a minute. Samantha Watson had a career-high 17 points. I'm pretty sure eight rebounds is also a career-high, and nine of 11 from the free-throw line, also a career-high. She, of course, she fouled out. I think they would have won if she had stayed in the game, but she still played remarkable. Audrey Winfrey had 14 points, six rebounds, hit both of her threes. That's one of the best performances she's had as a Tiger. Uh, Laney Mears had 11.7 rebounds. She didn't hit a three, but she only missed two shots, made four. So she still did pretty well considering the defenses were smothering her all game long. Grayson Williams had seven points, two rebounds, and a steal. And Joey Babel, who also fouled out, had six points and six rebounds. Now the men, and I told you, this double overtime loss, thriller loss, wasn't even the best thing that happened. I think there's one particular name that you guys can guess what made this game so special. Uh, I believe that would be Emery Knox. Exactly. Emery Knox, the junior guard from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, transferred from Charleston Southern, decided that after two single-digit scoring games, he was going to put up a career-high 39 points. His previous career-high was 23 uh, he shattered also, it. Shattered it. Game of his life. But even what was better, well, actually, according to him, and actually, we'll be able to hear from him pretty soon. But according to him, he had like a he had fifty points in high school or something, or thirty <laughs> point triple double. So not quite the game of his life, but still <laughs> pretty good game. But what makes this even more special? Um, so he his previous previous career high for three pointers made in a game was four. He had ten. Do you know how many attempts he had? Ten. He was ten of ten from the three-point line. That is the most. That is uh, he tied the Division II record for three-point percentage in a game, minimum of ten attempts. And the last was done by Rodney Edgerson at Kentucky Wesleyan versus Wisconsin Parkside in the mid 2000s. And I I'd, I'd be willing to bet that that's not very far from the, I don't know what the D1 record is, but I'd be oh, willing to no bet idea. like it's pretty close to that too. Like I doubt anybody's really gone much better than 10 for 10 in a no. in a collegiate game before. Now we don't know, I don't think we know what the consecutive the record for consecutive made threes is, but I imagine if he's not tied it, I would be shocked. I mean, there's guys that have made more threes in a game, but at this level of efficiency, very few. And he did also have a career high in field goals made with 13. His previous was seven. I, It was one of the best performances from a player I've seen in person. Probably the best performance I've seen from a player ever. I mean, this was just incredible uh, performance. Uh, he also tied the OBU and GAC record for most threes in a game, the last was also by a former Tiger, Lakey Westbrook. Uh, he went 10 of 11 from three in 2017. Now, he could have finished 10 of 10 in this game, but he had to put up a, a shot to beat the shot clock, and he missed, even though they had a lead uh, against Harding. And mm. he was just so close from keeping that record. He should have passed. But it was funny at the end of the game for Knox, um, he – Everybody, it was like 10 seconds left. Uh, Henderson had stopped playing defense, 
and everybody was telling Knox to shoot the ball. And he got, like, distracted. He was looking at the clock or something, and he, like, picked up the ball and started walking with it. Oh. And it was a turnover. <laughs> the game wasn't over. And uh, it actually drew a chuckle from Coach Nutt, so he wasn't in the doghouse for doing something like that. But outstanding performance. Let's hear from Knox right quick. Well, I'm Chris Gann. I'm joined by Emery Knox, point guard for Washita Men's Basketball. Emery, thank you for being with me today. Thank you for having me. Well, everybody's still kind of talking about this. 39 points, career high, and I don't know when the last time that we saw a near 40-point game for a Washita player, but you had it Thursday against Henderson State, which made you know that packed house really happy. What were some of your initial thoughts – That was your career high. I don't know. Have you had a game like that even in high school or AAU that even resembled that type of a performance? Uh, Yeah. In AAU, I used to play for a little, uh, like a home team. And uh, I actually, I probably had 50 one game. Um, So, yeah, I've done it before, but it was a while ago. Uh, High school, college, and all. Uh, The most I had in high school was like a 32-point triple-double. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's still pretty. That's still pretty good. But uh, what was even better is that thirty points came from threes. I, you ten of ten. Uh, you tied the Division two record for three point field goal percentages. Minimum of like ten attempts. Like only one other guy uh, in the past ten years has done that. Yeah. And at what point did you just realize every time I put a shot up, I'm not going to miss? You know. Um Honestly, it's just a blessing because every day I go to the gym, there's probably not a day I miss. So I go shoot every day. It's a regular thing, you know, get my shots up, you know. You got a repetition helps. So I was prepared. Um, In that case, though, my shots are just falling. I I had two games where I had a slump. Uh, I just wanted to come out and, you know, help the team win, help help myself, you know, uh, gain, regain confidence again and, you know, perform to the best of my ability. And luckily, uh, I was able to do that. Well, speaking of that slump, you had uh, just single-digit performances in those two games. What got you going in this game? Because you jumped out right away and got hot and stayed hot. I think it was just the urge to win. Uh, we kind of been losing this season. Uh, nobody's really been very happy about that because preseason we thought, you know, we got the we got the pieces, we got the talent. Like, we got everything we need. It's just a matter of, you know, executing and preparing and putting that on the floor. Um, But, yeah. So, not only did you have – okay, again, I'm going to go back. You had career highs in points, three-pointers made, field goals made, but you also had a career high in assists with seven. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of people I could hear when I was calling the game, there were a lot of people behind me just saying, shoot the ball because they wanted you to just keep making more. But – the whole time you were just running the offense and how important is that to you not just getting yourself hot but also getting your teammates going uh, that's a huge thing uh you know playing with my brothers you know you want to see everybody happy you want to see everybody eat especially when you have a night like you're having mm-hmm. uh the night that i had at least you know you want to see everybody eat you know i give all the glory to god though so you know in that in that position i was in i was just thinking you know i scored the ball and i'm not really big on scoring honestly like I'm a pass first guard, so uh, honestly, I just wanted to see everybody do well, and you know, T. Will uh, and M. J. Leslie, and you know, a couple other people stepped up to the plate, and uh, I was just happy for them, and happy that we get the win, and I know Coach is happy for us. Well, I know you guys were happy to have Tyler back as well. Uh, you know, he was dealing with an injury, and yep. and and he played well against Harding. Let's talk about and. I know this, this is your first uh, Battle of the Ravine, you know, the big rivalry here at Washita. What And I know you're coming from Division One Charleston Southern, mm-hmm. and this is more of a, uh, definitely a smaller atmosphere here in Arkadelphia than uh, in Charleston. But uh, what were your, your impressions of this sort of rivalry? I love the atmosphere. Uh, I wish every game was like that, honestly. I know the guys wish it was like that. Uh, but it was, a, it was a great outcome, great turnout. And, you know, luckily we were able to win. Uh, Unfortunately, our girls weren't able to win, but the environment was crazy. Um, It really got some of us going. I know me personally, uh, I don't really pay attention to the crowd. Um, So I was kind of like in my head, you know, just make sure, like I was telling myself, make sure 
I do what I need to do so we can win. Um, so I kind of stayed in that frame of mind, and I didn't really get too unfocused or phased. I know when I fell, uh, it looked like I got crossed up or whatever, you know. Uh, yeah, you didn't. Yeah, no. the, um, one of the dudes behind our bench from Henderson, he was talking to me. And I was like, okay, like, he was like, take number two out, take number two out. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> so I went back in, and I had the eight-point run, and I came back to the bench and looked at him. So I just – I just love, like, kind of interacting with the fans, you know, stuff like that. So it was a great environment. I loved it. Okay, so you guys, Saturday against Harding, you guys just a five-point loss. And Harding's always traditionally a tough team. You guys 0-2 against them. Uh, Kind of what went – I don't want to say what went wrong. I mean, I know foul foul trouble really played a key role in the outcome of that game. But what were some things that you saw from your performance that you could have done better that you can take into the next game? Yeah, um, just going off that, I know I was talking to Coach throughout the game. He was like, uh, some things I could have did better basically was, you know, put my head down, get down to the rim. Uh, He said I shoot 92% from the free throw line. He said nobody can stay in front of you, so get to the rim, you know, get to the free throw line, get shots up, and that's when you go shoot threes, make plays. Uh, So that was was one thing he definitely harped on. but other than that, I say we we really played hard. Like everybody played hard. Everybody played, you know, a, a good role in us being where we got. Ultimately, I feel like we pushed through and we played a very good game. It just came down to the last couple plays. Well, you guys have Southern Nazarene and Oklahoma Baptist both on the road, and you guys have yet to win a conference game on the road. Right. Is that even in y'all's minds, or is this just next game mentality? It's next game mentality. We take losses, we take wins. You know, we look at the losses as lessons, and, you know, every win, uh, we take that, put it on our shoulder, and then we keep moving forward. Uh, so, yeah, it's just it's just another game, honestly, uh, one that we want to win, one we can win. Uh, so we're going to put our best foot forward, and I know Coach is going to put his best foot forward, and we're going to do what we got to do to win. So you're coming from Charleston Southern, and you also, I know you said you played for sort of a home team for AAU, but you also played for, um, is it Brad Beal Elite? Is that who you? Oakwood Stars. That's Southeast. That's right. So I know that you, a lot of uh, pros and other college hoopers have come through that, that team. Did you ever get to play with anybody that, you know, people might recognize the name of or just anybody that you really kind of learned yeah, from? Yeah, I was on a team, uh, our whole AAU team for that, that year, that year or two, uh, everybody pretty much went Division One. I. I feel like we had probably like a player that go went Division II. Um, but other than that, everybody's good. I played with uh, Miles Tate. He's from South Carolina. Dylan Jones, everybody's from South Carolina. Uh, P.J. Hall plays on Clemson. <laughs> uh, you know, I, Jaquez Kirby, he plays at – Augusta, that's Division Two, but he's he was really good. Uh, Raekwon Horton plays at James Madison right now. Um, yeah, and a lot of other good players too. So yeah, how important is it to have a program like that and develop your skills? And you know, outside of just high school. Yeah, honestly, uh, I feel like it was a great experience. Even though I was kind of stuck in my shell, like I was scared to get out there. Probably didn't perform the best, like, on that team. There was a lot of, you know, bigger names and stuff like that. I didn't really get caught up in that, but uh, it definitely affected me in ways that I can see now. Uh, So, but playing on a a platform like that and being able to get your name out there, it's uh, it's actually amazing. And you do a lot of traveling and stuff like that, and everything's taken care of. And, you know, it's a a great experience, honestly. And I, I was blessed to have that experience and, you know, meet the people I met and make the connections I made. And yeah, it was great. You played three years at Charleston Southern mm-hmm. as well. And, um, you know, you, you had a nice, really nice three years there. And uh, what were some things that you learned that you've been able to, to take? And even though, you know, gone from D1 to D2, it, it seems like you've gotten better as a player, but I imagine you've learned a lot going, you know, now in your fourth year of college ball. Yeah, I I learned a lot from my three years there. Um, confidence is key. It's the biggest one. Uh, you know, just getting in the gym, doing, getting my shots up, repetition, just preparing to make sure I'm ready for practice, the next game, anything like that. Uh, another thing I would say is control what you can control. Uh, don't get too high, don't get too low. 
you hit a shot, cool, you make a sh- or you miss a shot, uh, you know, don't put your head down, just get back on defense, stuff like that. Uh, mentally, I feel like the biggest transformation for me from Division One to here, uh, I feel like I've grown a lot mentally because I came into a situation where, you know, I was told I was, you know, going to be like the head of the snake, basically. I was going to be able to run the, the team and stuff like that. And, you know, just coach having that confidence in me and, you know, kind of taking me under his wing and, you know, guiding me through all of it uh, is definitely helped me become a better player. And we've created a good relationship as well. Uh, so that's why I feel like I'm able to thrive and that's why my mental is better and that's why you know I'm here. Well um, when you were coming out of Charleston Southern what brought what kind of attract why Washaw basically? That's actually that's a good question. Um, Honestly uh, I would say selfishly I was thinking more of me rather than the team Uh, so I came here knowing that you know Coach Knight he had a a good uh, collegiate career and then he played it in the NBA as well. Uh, Just knowing that and based off his personality and stuff like that, uh, you know, he is a a good person to talk to and a great person to have, you know, build a bridge with. uh, And then on top of that, the position they put me in uh, on the way to come here, uh, as well as, you know, just uh, many of the amenities, uh, you know, they put me in an apartment and stuff like that. It was cool. Uh, so I really appreciate that. But honestly, the biggest reason I came to Washita was, I'm not going to say like I wanted to get away from home, but I wanted to be able to be free, you know, kind of have to worry about myself. Because uh, back home, I have my mom, my uh, two sisters and my little brother. Uh, so I'm the oldest. So uh always I've always been you know like there for them and like just being able to be here on my own and like go through the stuff that I have to go through alone and create my own path and figure things out by myself uh that's what I wanted because I felt like I was getting too comfortable being too close to home I I feel that but you know how how have you liked Arkansas so far I know it's a little different than South Carolina but yeah Charleston at that so uh yeah I mean it's nice you know, you get to uh, you really get to focus on yourself. There's not a lot of distractions, uh, so I, I like it for the most part. You you get a little bored, but it's okay. You know, <laughs> learning how to be by yourself. And I got you. Yeah. We ever go to Little Rock or anything like that? Yeah, I go with some teammates sometimes. Little Rock Hot Springs, go eat and stuff like that. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Well, again, I already asked about you know the upcoming road trip, and I know that's that's <coughs> definitely going to be something on all of your minds. Um, but just finishing out this season, tournament hopes are not out of the picture. This mm-hmm. conference is, you know, you guys win two games and you're probably number four in the conference standings. But what is it going to take for you guys to just reach that, that pinnacle that you all are trying to reach? A lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of communication, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. You know, you got to put everything into it and you get what you put in. So um, just – just going every day and you know putting our best foot forward and going to practice and practicing as hard as we can getting to the game making sure everything that we did in practice translates and you know listening to coach uh yeah and I, I'm hoping we go all the way uh I've been telling the guys I text them after our loss I was like next 10 we got to win I said 10 in a row um so it's just a mentality thing uh honestly feel like our practices have been picking up like as far as physically and you know uh, communication wise our defense has been getting better um, so I feel like once we get on a roll there's not too many teams that can you know stop us well um, now I, w- I was gonna say I expect another 39 point game from you but honestly a win I know is what you guys value the most so yes. that's definitely what we'll be hoping for but this is Emory Knox thank you so much for joining me thank you for having me so it wasn't just Knox that led to this huge win for Washita. He only had 39 of the 91 points. So the other points came from guys like Taryn Williams, who had 23 points, only missing four shots. MJ Leslie, who had 17, hit five three-pointers. We would be talking about him and Taryn Williams a lot if it wasn't for Emory Knox in this game. And then Rollin Belton, he did foul out, but he did have uh, six points, eight rebounds, two blocks. 
Washita shot 66% from three, 55% from the field, had 24 points in the paint, 12 points off turnovers, and all that saying that Henderson still shot pretty well. 46% from the field, 40% from three, 48 points in the paint, also 30, uh, 34 points off the bench and 17 second chance points. So, uh, And also got Tyler Haynes back, so that's good news for yeah. Washita. Um, all right, so enough basketball for just the moment. Washita women's indoor track and field, they had a, a meet at uh, Pitt State, and that was the Wendy's Pitt State Invitational. And no, that is not, like we sadly discovered, that has no relations to the actual Wendy's fast food chain. But anyway, uh, it was still a pretty good day for Washita. Um, they only had one runner that placed in the top five in any event, and that was uh, Caitlin Nashtagal. She placed fourth in the 3,000 meter, but three school records were set. Zoe Carter set a new OBU record in the 600 meter uh, with the time of 1 minute 28 seconds, 0.64. Ellie Homan had a, a new record for OBU in the 800 as well. She finished in the top 20. And she also broke her own record previously. And then the medley, the distance medley relay team of Izzy Burrow, Anna Woolsey, and J.C. McGregor, and Macy Cash, they broke uh, the previous record for Washita, finishing sixth overall. So still a pretty good event, especially competing against other D2, JUCO, and Division One opponents. Now I'll let you guys kind of take this one away. So Washita played Harding on Saturday. And the women, yes, they lost against Henderson, but they still played leaps and bounds better than they did on Saturday. 100%. Um, though our women shot 29.8% from the field, 14.3% from three. I mean, those those uh, percentages are definitely not what we're looking for. Um, 26 points in the paint, six uh, fast break points. We also had 12 turnovers, I think. Turnovers have kind of been an issue for us, especially in close games, but that's really not that bad of a number. Um, and we were out-rebounded by Harding 49-36. to 36. Um, Harding shot 31.3% from the field, 25% from three, had 28 points in the paint, and had nine points off of turnovers, as well as 17 second-chance points. And they also only had 12 turnovers, so we didn't lose a turnover battle, which is always a good thing. Um, and I think this is what you were talking about from Madeline Tipton having a career – game scoring 28 points three rebounds two steals and going 10 for 19 from the field almost better than 50 percent um grayson fairless had six points two rebounds abby harrison had five points six rebounds one steal and three blocks and joey babel had four points six rebounds and one steal and one thing i want to point out is joey babel and finally getting to like see her actually play in person i mean what you said last week was right she's always the smallest person on the court and just finds a way to get a rebound all the time. Um, I think she's averaging over five rebounds a game at her size, which is just crazy. Um, I know this obviously wasn't the outcome we were looking for against Harding. We're always wanting to beat the Bison, especially after coming off that close loss from you know the Battle of the Ravine game. But I have no doubt that the women are going to get back on track because they got some girls that can really hoop on that team. Well, one thing that I also noticed, uh, Laney Mears did not have a field goal in this game. Uh, and that's you know not particularly a good sign for Washita and Madeline Tipton was the only player in double digits. The next closest was Fairless at six points. So that's and it's not like you know oh everybody else got five or six points. No, mm-hmm. no, the, like four points was like the th- the fourth best scorer on the team. So offense was certainly an issue in this game. Uh, but I will say. Like you talked about, Harding also didn't shoot that well. I mean, 25% from three, 31% from the field, so wasn't particularly great. Now, um, looking at the men's game, they also lost. Now, they did just come away with a five-point loss uh, on Saturday. And, Zach, what can you tell me about this game? Yeah, I think uh, on offense, we played pretty well. You know, we shot 45%. 33 from the from the three-pointers shot 75% free throws so you know that's not bad and uh, 34 points in the paint like 
be, being able to see we got almost half of our points in the paint that's that's a nice sign that I like to look for because in my opinion you know you get points in the paint you get layups you get those post up points that's the easiest way to score and the most efficient way to score so it was good to see we were able to get some offensive production from there but um our defense just wasn't really quite there you know we obviously we gave up 83 points we lost 83 78 and then also we were only to get, we were only able to get nine points off of turnovers which just just doesn't really help you out a lot um uh, other than scoring in the paint, being able to score in transition is a really nice way to be able to pad pad some points, try and get a lead going. But, you know, if you don't force very many turnovers, it's going to be hard to do that. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, Taron Williams, he's been a very consistent bright spot for us. I think in the Battle of the Ravine he had 23 or 25 yeah, points. And yeah. In this game he had 27 points. Um, he shot 10 for 21, so, you know, he made half his shots and he grabbed six rebounds to go along with it. So... Um, and Emery Knox, he he fell back down to earth, but he still had a pretty good game. He still had 16 points and five rebounds, and he also made half his shots. And uh, Tyler Haynes, it was really good to see him get get back going because um, I think he was a he, he was a big factor in us winning in the Battle of the Ravine because he'd missed the past few games, and but he came back against Henderson, played well, and then in this game he was able to grab 13 points and five rebounds. So I think we were really missing his presence, and then. Um, Reggie Martin, he was also able to add on 10 points and three rebounds. Well, something that, as you heard from Emory, that he talked about, foul trouble was um, part of the the game. Um, and Rollin Belton fouled out. Tyler Haynes was playing this game with four, and I think maybe one or two other players were playing with three or four fouls. So uh, maybe cut down those fouls and they win this game. So... Um, but they still held Harding to 18% from three-point line, so that's definitely a, a huge positive. Um, but, yeah, I think this may have been a career high for Taron Williams. I, I, I'd have to go look at my notes, but it seems like career highs are happening left and right. Um, but Emory Knox, he, he also had three uh, threes, so um, he still was feeling it a little yeah. bit, but I did see Harding had made a big post on Twitter. It was a packed house there, so I – you know, I imagine it was rocking, and of course, they're rivals with us, so maybe that's that's why. But um, outside of basketball and track and field, there was wrestling this past weekend on Sunday. Not particularly the best weekend for the wrestling team. They lost Fort Hay State and Central Missouri in Warrensburg, Missouri. Uh, lost Fort Hay State five to forty nine, and Central Missouri zero to forty three. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our Tiger Prow preview, and the first game chronologically that will be occurring, uh, your boy Weston's going to be a part of, and that's going to be the baseball game, the first baseball game against North Northeastern State, and that's not going to be at home. It's still going to be in Arkansas. It's going to be at the Majestic Park in Hot Springs, Arkansas, a legendary baseball field. But uh, I imagine the team feels good and giddy, excited. <laughs> oh, we're so stoked. Um, this first weekend is going to be crazy. Four straight games and four straight days in the Dugan Collegiate Baseball Invitational. And we're playing Northeastern State, like you just mentioned, on Thursday and Friday, um, back-to-back days. Um they have a brand new coach, but they've been, you know, a good program. We're, I mean, we couldn't be more excited. I'm hoping to make my college debut this weekend. It, it It's going to be a great time. Um, like he said, we play back-to-back days. And then Saturday we play the Colorado School of the Mines, actually here in Arkadelphia, sadly not on Rab Rogers Field. We're going to be playing over at Henderson State's field. And then Sunday we play Missouri Southern, who has actually hosted a regional. I believe they hosted a regional last year. Very good program. We're excited to get after them. And then we actually, the next weekend, go up to Missouri Southern and play a full weekend series against them. So Sunday is going to be a little bit of a preview for us and what that series is going to look like. But, I mean, we're we're stoked. We have a lot of old guys, like I've mentioned before. Um, Cooper Timmons is a fifth-year guy. I think he's going to be making his third straight opening day start on Thursday. Wow. So that's going to be really cool to see. Friday, um, junior Luke House, who has MLB aspirations, will be on the mound. We just have a lot of guys that are really excited and can get after it. And from a pitching staff point of view, I- I'm super excited. All the freshmen we brought in this year are going to be really good and help us a lot. And, uh, I mean, I think this first weekend is going to be a great opener for us as we you know get started. I really can't wait. I, I think I'm the most excited about baseball ever. 
I mean, yeah. it, it seems like we got a great team that's going to make a run at the GAC tournament. So, oh, on that note, actually, one more thing: we actually yeah. got e- ever. So there's the GAC preseason polls, obviously, mm-hmm. every year. Uh, we were picked to finish third this year, which I think is our highest in almost a decade, and we got our first ever first place vote. Yeah. Um, in those awesome. GAC polls, and obviously that. You know, it's easy to get wrapped up in that, and we definitely don't, you know, don't get wrapped up in that. But it's just cool to see that people are starting, finally starting to recognize, and hopefully we can just keep, you know, upping the expectations. Yeah, well, it's going to be a great year for you guys. I just know it, so we can't wait to watch. And maybe I'll, I'll call some baseball games. I'm mostly a softball guy. So, uh, but anyway, so uh thank you for that preview and uh we'll ask you about your thoughts after every game how about that we don't have to bring anybody to interview just have you so (laughs) awesome um but also happening on thursday the uh, basketball teams will be heading to bethany oklahoma to take on southern nazarene and the women will have a tough task against southern nazarene they're always pretty tough the men Okay, so the interesting thing with the men, and while I'm talking, I am going to pull up the GAC poll for men's basketball because it's really interesting what the conference is looking like. So Arkansas Tech has been the team in the conference. They're 14-4 and four overall, 10-2 and two in the conference. Southeastern Oklahoma State, 13-7 and seven overall, 9-3 and three in the Great American Conference. But then from 3 to... Uh, 12, it's almost separated by three games. Uh, Washita is tied with Southern Nazarene for 12th, or well, 11th in the conference. But if they get maybe one or two wins, or maybe one win and a bunch of teams have, you know, a loss or something, then we could potentially see a five way tie for seventh and that would be in i'm pretty sure that would be in the conference tournament so and that would just be a a one game separation Uh, it's just incredible the conference now washaw has to win a conference game on the road that that's going to be huge and that's what this weekend's all about they have to win these next two games and these are very winnable games i mean both Oklahoma Baptist and Southern Nazarene have losing records overall and in the conference. So it's going to be interesting there. Now, while I'm on the subject, let's look at the women's basketball standings in the Great American Conference. So Southern Nazarene, I would say it's the team to beat, but they have not been beaten. They are 18-0 and overall uh, wow. and 12-0 and in the conference. Now, Washita is sitting... Um, Sorry, my brain's a little slow. I'm trying to count. I think eighth in the conference right now. Not particularly the best place where they want to be. They've lost the last three games. They're going to have to win some games pretty soon. And against Southern Nazarene, uh, they haven't lost a game all season. So, like I said, it's going to be a tough game. But knowing what this team this team can do, I think it's possible. Would love to see the upset. We just got to start hitting some shots. So, um on Friday, men and women swim and dive will be heading to Cleveland, Mississippi to take on Delta State. And then, as we mentioned, also another baseball game on Saturday. It'll be, you know, in the hot, or that's not Saturday, that's Friday. That will be in Hot Springs against Northeastern State. And then softball, they open their season against Northwest Missouri State, and that will be right here at home at 2 p.m. and then they play right after just two and a half hours later against Missouri S&T. And then men's tennis, they open the new year and they are also number 25 in the, excuse me, not the conference, but the country in men's tennis and they open their season at home against Delta State. Now on Saturday, men and women swim and dive will still be performing and then of course softball versus Northeastern State at home at noon and then you guys will play Colorado School of Mines also at noon across the street women's basketball and men's basketball will be playing against Oklahoma Baptist in Shawnee Oklahoma at 1 and 3 p.m. respectfully then at 2 30 softball plays versus Missouri Southern here at home men's tennis plays here at home again against Southwest Baptist that is a busy couple of days that is Whew. And then Sunday, you guys play Missouri Southern. So that is what we have on tap 
this coming week. Now, briefly, uh, Super Bowl. Chiefs and 49ers, neither of the teams that I wanted, and I think everybody in this country except maybe Packers, Lions, and or not Lions, but Packers, Bears, and Viking fans wanted the you know wanted the Lions in the Super Bowl. Didn't happen. Still a phenomenal run by that team, but who do you have? Um. I gotta say, it's n- neither team in the Super Bowl is who I was rooting for either. Yeah. So, um, honestly, I'm thinking about boycotting the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> but I guess if I had to pick a team that I think would win, I'd probably have to go with the Niners. I think they're the most complete team, probably. Um, but I mean, all credit to the Chiefs; their defense has been outstanding. I don't think yeah. people talk about their defense. No, enough, they don't. You know, yeah. um, like the Ravens, they looked pretty much unstoppable, and then they scored seven points like early in the game and didn't score after that. You know, the Chiefs handled them pretty well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think um, I just think given the Niners, you know, how impressive their offense and defense has looked, and like how consistent they've looked. You know, they just they, it's like they don't even play bad games, and they also showed. In the event they did, if they were to get down to the Chiefs, they're still totally capable of coming back because they were down, what, like 24 to 7 to the Lions? And then they, yeah, they, yeah. Ended, they ended up beating them 34 to 24. So well, which they're is definitely able to climb out of a hole in case they do. Because their head coach was the offensive coordinator when the Falcons were up 28 to 3. Yeah. So, so maybe there's a little bit circle of a yeah, full circle moment. Yeah. Choking is in their, in their DNA, I guess. But. <laughs> but. It was definitely tough to see the Lions fall to the Niners. Yeah, but um, uh, what about you, Weston? <sighs> I I think as a football fan, I'm going to root for the Chiefs in this one. Not necessarily because I think they're going to win, but more so because I'd like to see Mahomes' legacy continue to improve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just as, like, you know, he gets thrown into GOAT conversation and stuff like that, I'm I think. Sure just as a football fan. And I also think with Travis Kelsey nearing retirement, um, stuff like that, I, I just think the storyline would be a little bit cooler for them. But obviously, like you all said, I was pulling for the Lions there. Um, and he's from Texas. So. Uh, yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's. That. I was actually rooting for the Chiefs because I'm a Texans fan and, and the Ravens yeah, uh, beat right. us. Knocked but the Texans out. But, uh, I mean, I think it's going to be a good Super I don't think it's necessarily the Super Bowl that the people wanted, but I yeah. think it'll be a Super Bowl that'll end up delivering. Um, I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. And, you know, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, uh, I would definitely take the Chiefs. Yeah. Okay, but if I was a betting man, I think I would put down a deposit to see if, okay, if the Chiefs won, do you think Travis Kelsey Proposed oh, I Taylor saw Swift. that. I was, I was going to say that. I was like, nah, that doesn't pertain to the show. I saw that betting one. The over, it's like uh, no is obviously – it's like the minus 150 and like the yes is plus 150. Yeah. I think hammering the no would be the easiest money of your life yeah. if you're a betting man. I think it's yeah. funny, like, the lines that they do. Because th- don't they also do something for the Gatorade flavor? Do they? Yes. yes. Yeah, they the Gatorade like, color and, and how, how long the national anthem goes. How long the national yes, anthem yes. goes. Yeah. The coin toss, heads or tails. Yes. Yeah. It, there's all There's sorts of little, you know, Easter egg, little goodies that you can find in the game. People will throw their money at yeah. anything. <laughs> yeah. If they can bet on it, it will be bet on. Yes. So, um, That's yeah. awesome. But, I, I, you know, I'm personally going for the 49ers because uh, if – if there's any Taylor Swift fans out there, I'm sorry, but I don't. I'm kind of tired of seeing Taylor Swift stuff all the time. <laughs> I did see where she has uh, for the NFL, and what what I was gonna say. If you don't want to see her, there is a ch- there's a chance that she's not at the game. People Actually, are saying no. She's no. so she's gonna be on her Eras tour, but I did see yeah. in in Japan. Yeah. Well, I saw where Bleacher Report broke down exactly how yeah, she could I've get seen that. back. Yeah. Because. In wherever in Japan she's going to be, that's 17 hours ahead of Vegas. Yeah, so by true. the time, and she's got maybe a 13 hour flight. Yeah. So, so. she's back by uh, kickoff. Assuming time. there's no delays, you know, no, she's no, got no she's, tampering. She definitely has her own jet. She, yeah. she does have her own jet. So, yeah. yeah but anyway, no, what I was going to. You can dream. Yeah. Um, well, darn it. Now I forgot what I was going to say. But. Um, well, I will say this uh, for us Arkansas fans: we can root for the 49ers because Brandon Allen and Dre Greenlaw are going to be in the Super Bowl, back in the Super Bowl because uh, 
Dre was with uh, with 49ers when they mm-hmm. lost to the Chiefs a few years ago. Brandon Allen was probably with Cincinnati, wasn't he? Uh, was he with the Bengals? I think he was with no? the Broncos at that time. He was with the Broncos? Maybe. Maybe he was with the Bengals. I can't remember, but he won one, I think, with the, the Patriots when he – like, he was drafted by Jacksonville. Why I know this, I, I've been bored too many times <laughs> and I look up all former hogs. Yeah. But uh, he was drafted by Jacksonville, and then I think he was traded to the Patriots where he never played. I don't think he played until he was, like, in Denver. But he won a Super Bowl as, like, a third stringer. Yeah. So now he's back and bringing that no playing experience right to the 49ers no, but uh no they're an interesting team because i think brock purdy gets so much hate when it's unwarranted yeah because yeah he's he's a really good quarterback and but he was also he's only in his second year he's he was the well, I don't even know what pick, but the very last pick of last year's draft. Mr. Irrelevant. Yeah, yeah Mr. Irrelevant. And he was the third string quarterback to start this season. And, or not this year, but the year before. And he's been this great player, and he gets so much hate and criticism for it. Yeah. Just because they're like, oh, he's a game manager. It's like, well, what else should a second year player yeah. be? He yeah. also he also had a Tommy, I think it was Tommy John surgery he over did, the offseason. Towards yeah, UCL. Yeah, because yeah, he was playing hurt in the last year's playoffs. Yeah, and so, yeah, exactly. And, you know, it doesn't look like it's really slowed him down much this year. So he's, I think being able to bounce back from injuries like that is something, you know, it's a that's a great thing to see, you know, because sometimes it slows players down and it's yeah. sad to see, you know, but sometimes guys never come back the same, but it didn't really look like it slowed him down any at all. Well, the 49ers are always in this good position for the next two years with him because he's getting paid peanuts, basically, because oh, yeah. he was the very last pick, so he gets the least amount of money. But I promise you, if I'm him and if I'm his agent, we're restructuring that contract <laughs> the, the day the Super he's, Bowl's over. Yeah, he's going to get a lot of – well, they, I don't think you can restructure. I don't think – not with a deal like that. When you restructure, it typically means you get less money. You don't get more because you you allocate you know however much because that's what happened when Mahomes signed that massive deal. A year later, he restructures it to where they can have more cap room. That's mm-hmm. why Tyree Kill actually part of why he didn't stick around because they wanted him to restructure his contract. He did not. He wanted to get paid now. He wanted well, and they still won a Super Bowl without him. So <laughs> yeah. kind of showed that but, maybe too. Yeah. Now I will say for the Chiefs, there's a, another Arkansas connection, B.J. Thompson, who only played one game with them. He was a fifth round rookie, uh, played at Stephen F. Austin. Uh, he is from England, Arkansas. So hopefully he can get in the game again. I have been bored and looked up too many you know Arkansas players too many times to know this stuff, but it is still pretty cool that England, Arkansas has. Yeah. A, uh, a uh, representative Super in the Bowl. Super Bowl. Oh, and uh, again, my football Arkansas nerdiness wilding out. A guy that played at uh, University of Central Arkansas is going to be playing before the 49ers, and that's George Odom. Enough from me. So that that's probably about it because that's that's going to be what's going on. That's this that's weekend. Well, it'll be it'll next, two weeks. next two weeks. Because yeah, okay. this weekend they'll do like Pro Bowl, like stuff like that. Oh, they'll that's probably right. come out with like MVP and mm-hmm. all that stuff. honor awards and yeah. the yeah. flag football game at the Pro yeah. Bowl. Don't even get me. We don't got enough time for that. <laughs> yeah. But. No, no. But yeah. Well, anyway, thank you all for tuning in. Tune in next week when we talk about the opening week of baseball and softball. We'll get to hear from one of base- Washita baseball's finest, Weston Bailey, about his thoughts on the wins, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully all four are wins, hopefully. No, no, not even knock on wood. I'm pretty confident that we're going to get some <laughs> wins. But anyway, thank you for tuning in. Have a good evening, and go Tigers.